What is he doing? Is he trying to read my mind? Huh. Hello, wonderful person. On that somewhat cheesy introduction, we're actually going to be talking about a somewhat intriguing study. A study that kind of claims to have read the mind of several people to some extent. And to be more specific, reconstructed some of the language and some of the thoughts by using non-invasive MRI techniques and artificial intelligence. And this by itself, though might sound like science fiction, is actually a somewhat intriguing proposition and a somewhat intriguing study. A study that has not been peer-reviewed yet, but from what I've read so far, does seem pretty genuine and quite intriguing. And so let's discuss what the scientists did here, how they did this, talk about potential misconceptions this might lead to, addressing them right away, and also just talk about where this is going and how this might help us in the future. But maybe let's start with what this is not. This is definitely not telepathy, not any kind of mind reading where you can actually know exactly what the person is thinking, nor is this a direct interpretation of actual thought of a person, especially against their will. All of this has to have willing participants, and at least in this case, does involve MRI, specifically functional MRI. But I guess more importantly, the actual reconstruction at the end was obviously not perfect at all. There were quite a lot of mistakes, quite a lot of text and ideas changed at least to some extent, and more importantly, it mostly worked with very simple media. So there are obviously quite a lot of limitations. But how exactly does this work? So first of all, when it comes to MRI machines, they all operate under a similar principle. The principle that in order to have certain thoughts, you have to activate certain brain parts. And in order to activate certain brain parts, your neurons have to become more active and thus have a lot more blood flow, and specifically blood flow filled with oxygen, that tends to possess specific properties, in this case slightly magnetic properties, which can then be seen remotely by looking at it with extremely powerful magnets. And so that's sort of the natural, or the very basic natural, of how MRI works. But the thing is, it's a relatively slow process. As a matter of fact, let's just say I ask you to think of an elephant. It's probably going to take at least 20 seconds for that part where you have the representation of an elephant to light up and to be visible in a typical MRI scan. And so because of this, this is not actually an easy process. As a matter of fact, it does take quite a lot of training and quite a lot of data. And the participants in the study had to listen to approximately 16 hours of different types of data, trying to imagine it in their mind and trying to essentially use their mental voice while they were being scanned in order to then produce certain observations visible in the MRI. And all of these multiples of observations were then used with the original script to roughly assign various types of words and various types of meaning to various parts of the brain that lit up during the MRI scan. And here's the really, really important part. Every single one of these scans and data in this case had to be individualized. And that's because we all wire things differently inside our brains. Which of course means that you can't just read someone else's mind now by using this particular algorithm and by using this data. It can only work with that one person and very likely only for a certain time. If you come back to this a few years later, the data might not work anymore. Nevertheless, after the training, in this case, the algorithm was able to decode or read the words that a person was hearing or even thinking during a typical MRI scan. But the algorithm was not decoding every individual word. As I mentioned before, the blood flow in our brain is much slower than that, so it might take anywhere from 10 to 20 seconds for a certain area to light up, even though we might have heard approximately 20 words in that time. Instead, it was focusing on a much higher level meaning, trying to interpret actual images and even sometimes actual sentences. And because in this case they focused on a variety of different media that the subjects listened to for approximately 16 hours, it allowed for a lot more diversity and made this particular model a lot more accurate. Although unfortunately in this case they only had three subjects, and so there's maybe a bit of a limitation in terms of how accurate this would be with everyone. Nevertheless, it did work for these three subjects and worked relatively well. With the algorithm then trying to make various guesses on what the person was looking at or was trying to think, and trying to interpret it in terms of words and sentences. In one example, they used a silent movie that the algorithm was able to interpret assigning different words and different sentences to various scenes. And though it wasn't super accurate and made mistakes with, for example, pronouns or different genders, it was accurate enough. In most cases, it looks like the algorithm was able to understand the scene and the actual action, but not really the actual actor or who was doing it. But definitely a pretty important first step in trying to create this technology. The next question, I guess, is why would you want to make this? Well, obviously this would be for people that are unable to communicate 
or to create what's known as assistive technology. The simplest example here would be obviously a hearing aid, but I guess the more famous example is the assistive technology that the late Stephen Hawking used to communicate and to even write books. But in his case, he had to use his mouth to move a pointer in order to select different letters, so he was actually extremely slow and it took him a really long time to write even a single book. However, this new technology would technically allow people with various disabilities to communicate practically in real time. Although the problem in this case is that they can't really be always inside the MRI machine. And so for this reason, this technology and this algorithm could now be transferred to a slightly different technology by, for example, using this, magnetoencephalography, an imaging technique that is also non-invasive, much more portable, much easier to use, and also provides data much faster. So in theory, by doing something similar using this, the scientists might be able to create something that's even faster and more effective. Although one particular interesting discovery from this study is, I guess, in regards to how our brain seems to assign meaning to various concepts in different parts of the brain. This concept is sometimes referred to as schema, and it's essentially, well, technically thoughts or concepts that we store as a kind of an interconnection of different neurons that generally all light up all at once, with billions of neurons participating even in a simple thought. Although, as I mentioned before, because of individual differences, each of them would have to be assigned and trained for every individual participant or person that needs to use this technology. Which is of course great news. It means that you can't just read someone else's mind by using the data from another person. And here the results also suggest that certain areas in our brain are a lot more important for the semantic information. Information involving meaning. A lot of these are in the prefrontal cortex, but some of them are also in other areas as well. And I guess more intriguingly, they also discovered that different parts of the brain, specifically the left and the right side, seem to represent the same information in a very similar manner. So for example, you can actually only read the left side of the brain to discover what the entire brain is thinking. Although in some cases, certain thoughts would be more prominent in one part of the brain, which becomes a little bit more apparent if you look at the image here. But why this is happening is of course unknown to us. But really the most surprising part of all of this was the fact that it worked on silent movies movies that did not involve any language. And so even though this was trained using spoken language, it was then able to reconstruct the meaning of a movie that didn't actually have any spoken language in it and only had images and perceived meaning. Although in this case, they did ask the participants to use their mental voice to try to explain the movie to themselves. And then they also tried to see what sort of stimuli or what sort of words can sort of create the problems for this particular decoder especially if you're trying to make as many mistakes as possible. And so they asked the three subjects to try to count, to try to name things, or try to imagine animals, while also listening to another story. And turns out that naming and also imagining various animals was the most distracting activity. The decoder was not able to reconstruct the language when a person was thinking of some sort of an animal or when they were trying to name someone or something. And so that's one way you can distract this decoder or prevent it from reading someone's mind. But nevertheless, it worked for the most part. And because this is a first such study using just three participants, it's an exciting first step. Now, as I mentioned, the study still has to be peer reviewed and someone still has to try to recreate this using some other data. But assuming that it does work, one day all this might lead to some exciting technologies assisting various people that actually cannot communicate otherwise. Or maybe even lead to some other discoveries using machine brain interface where we can essentially control something by using just our thoughts. At the moment though, all of this is still in its infancy, with all of this just being a pioneering study with very preliminary discoveries. But in a few years from now, we might actually have exciting technology that doesn't just help us interpret someone's thoughts, but actually helps us understand how these thoughts are formed and how our brain is able to process all of this information to begin with. Because for me personally, that's really my main interest. How exactly does any of this work? How do we form thoughts? What happens in our brains when we do think of an animal? All of this is super complex, and all of this we are going to be discussing more on the channel in some of the future videos. And we'll actually discuss some of these in previous videos that you can find in the description. But on that note, once we learn something else, or once the new video comes out about the complexity of human brain, I'll make sure to follow this up with another video. Until then, thank you for watching, check out the links in the description below, subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.